Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Uh, we've had a fantastic response to this event, uh, especially in the light of the number of invitations you must be receiving at the moment. And we're expecting advisors dialing in from all over the country. My name is Dan Powell, uh, Business Account Manager Midlands South for Embark. I'm delighted to be joined virtually by my colleague John Brooks, who covers the Midlands North, and especially Dan Norman from TCF Investment, who will be delivering his presentation in a moment. Uh, normal rules apply in as much as we, we will put everyone on mute, but if you could also check yourselves that you are on mute, that, that would be helpful. Uh, we're not intending to use the webcam today, and we therefore possibly strongly suggest that everyone turns their own off, just uh, uh, if you if you want to. Um, if during the session you have a question, uh, then you can do one of two things. Uh, either click on my name, uh, Dan Powell, and send the question through to me, uh, or else just type it into the chat function and we will monitor this and deal with the questions at the end. Uh, we are recording the session. Uh, I have remembered to click the record button. So uh, if afterwards you feel others within your business may benefit from seeing it, uh, then let whoever invited you know. Uh, I believe there is a way of sending the link to the recording. recording. Finally, CPD uh, will be issued for the webinar, so it will help us to allocate this correctly uh, if you've registered with your name when entering today. Having said all that, uh, I'd like to hand over to my colleague John Brooks, who's going to kick things off and introduce Dan Norman and today's session. John, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dan, and uh, good morning, everybody. Great to see so many of you uh, attending today. Before handing over to Dan Norman, I just wanted to do a very quick positioning piece about the Embark Group. So you may have seen in the press that on the 1st of May, the former Zurich intermediary platform uh, and our top performing Horizon multi-asset fund range were transferred across to Embark uh, as part of the sale of the Zurich platform business. So now having rebranded rebrand the platform to advance by Embark, uh, we're all really excited about the opportunities that this increased scale will present for both our existing relationships, but also for IFAs uh, who may not have engaged with us before, and many of you, of course, uh, have dialed in today. So the, the Embark Group is one of the largest and fastest growing platform providers in the UK, with 34 billion of assets under administration, uh, and has twice been awarded the Wealth FinTech 100 Award, uh, which differentiates ourselves as a top 100 company in the world for the delivery of technology solutions within our industry. So in addition to the, 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 to the group, the, uh, we've also got the SaaS and the SIP uh, solutions. We are now the largest SaaS and full SIP provider in the UK. Uh, and we've got innovative products such as the family SIP and also our DB SaaS in the stable. So we'd be delighted to update anybody on the opportunities we have within the wider group. However, that is enough about us. So an introduction to our guest speaker, uh, the legend that is at Mr. David Dan Norman. So Dan has held several senior roles in financial service companies before becoming the CEO of Credit Suisse Asset Management in the UK. Uh, Dan in 2009 then founded uh, the TCF Investment Company which is a boutique multi-asset DFM uh, with a desire to help IFAs with their investment process. Uh, TCF has provided support to advisor firms of all sizes looking to enhance, refine or build their CIP and CRPs and has supported over 150 firms with due diligence and prod compliance. So today, uh, Dan is going to cover the background to CRPs why advisors need to consider them and uh, the key differences between a CRP and a CIP. He'll also provide um, some tips, practical checklists and templates to help you build, refine or challenge your current CRP process at a time, let's face it, where the FCA are taking a very keen interest in how firms are providing income to clients in retirement. So without further ado, I shall hand over to Dan. 
Good morning, everybody. Well, welcome to Zoom and Teams. There we go. Um, uh, it's amazing how meetings have changed. I think the best one I've had so far uh, with the lady IFA in Glasgow was suddenly where Minnie Mouse ears appeared on the back of her head, followed by a small hand. So um, let's hope this one goes slightly better. So learning outcomes, what are we going to talk about today? Um, broad understanding about what centralised retirement propositions are. So what's the difference between those and CIPs? Um, we're going to look at some ideas in terms of how you might build a CIP uh, and a CRP, the differences between those. What's good practice for a CRP? And then hopefully some kind of templates, tips, ideas um, and things for you to kind of take away and look at your own CIP uh, build or development or change. Um, uh, this is a CPD session, so it'll be CPD at the end of it. Um, and also there's a feedback form. So if you want any of the templates or the slides or copies of information, uh, then we'll be able to provide those um, at the end. Who are we? Uh, I think John's pretty much covered that. Um, we've done an awful lot of work with the different advisor firms, um, helping them with their CIPs and then CRPs uh, and prod as part of that. Um, we also do a lot of work with advisor firms in terms of helping them to show the value. Um, firms now do a huge amount of work, research, due diligence, compliance in the background. Uh, and it's very easy to forget, actually, that's incredibly valuable to customers. Um, and I'll touch on a little bit on that uh, later on today. So agenda, background, why is this important? What are CIPs? What's the regulatory and demographic background for that? Touch on prod. Um, do I need a CRP? So we'll have a look at that. And if we do, uh, what does good look like? Um, we'll look at development of a CRP, what things might you go through, what are the steps you might want to look at um, in developing them. Uh, and then at the end, tips, templates, checklists, um, and other things to help you with that process. Uh, and then finally, as I said, next steps, uh, the Embark team are happy to kind of follow up afterwards. Um, we're also thinking about doing um, additional workshops um, or little seminars. Uh, we may do another large one like this or happy to do kind of one to one sessions in terms of helping you and your firm specifically. So what's all the fuss about? Um, uh, the UK is aging and aging very rapidly. Um, uh, the FCA noticed in 2019, post pensions freedoms, uh, that a whole bunch of different risks had appeared in retirement planning. Uh, before pensions freedoms, it was pretty simple, you know, save up, buy an annuity. Um, that all changed. And the risks associated with that are many and various, uh, not just investment risks, but kind of behavioral risks uh, uh, and the way that people are trying to assess their drawdown income over time. Um, that's progressed in 2020. Um, FCA looks at assessing suitability part two, and we'll look at that. Um, a cynic might suggest that that's all about DB transfers, but actually it's about the scale and the seriousness of this retirement income problem. Uh, the FCA is also kind of getting fed up uh, that we as an industry not taking prod seriously enough. Um, and so is the European regulator who's already um, given the FCA might smack on the wrists. Um, so we need to look at prod um, as part of that. This is all about developing better processes and delivering better outcomes and actually being able to show better value to clients. Uh, so in fact, having a good CRP is a good thing. Um, this is where it started. Um, the FCA in their sector views in January 19. Um, some firms have not yet updated their investment strategies for decumulation clients. Um, so the question is, have you? Um, notice it's investment strategies, not necessarily investment products. You may well use the same investment products for accumulation and decumulation, but the way you use them and the background of the thinking about how you deploy them is what's critical for a CRP. That's progressed, as we know, with suitability part two. Um, anybody who's had the, um, uh, the questionnaire will know how detailed and thorough it is in terms of what the FCA require from you. Um, what they're looking for is, is advice suitable? Um, are charges disclosed? Do you act in the best interest of your clients? Um, uh, conflicts of interest has come as a really powerful thing coming out. Uh, and we'll touch on some of what are those conflicts of interest? What is the FCA particularly kind of um, focusing on? Um, one area that they're really concerned about is about fact finding. Um, their view is that post pensions freedoms, um, the risks of decumulation have changed. And therefore, your fact finding process needs to have changed to collect the information to be able to provide that advice. Um, so if your fact find still says 2017 on the bottom of it, um, it's probably time to change it. Um, uh, and I don't just mean the date at the bottom. Um, this is what they're concerned about. Um, the risk between accumulation and decumulation are very different. Um, the obvious one is sequence of return risk. Um, 
sequence of return risk and accumulation doesn't exist. If you have a portfolio which does 5%, then 4%, then 3%, then 2%, then 1%, or it does 1%, then 2%, then 3%, then 4%, then 5%, in accumulation, you get the same outcome. In decumulation, if you're taking income, you get very, very different answers. Um, so how are you managing that risk? Um, what is your strategy for addressing that risk? That's kind of one area. Other things they're really concerned about is the withdrawal rate. Um, how do you have you identified that the withdrawal rate that you're suggesting for clients or clients are using is sustainable? What's your evidence for that? Um, if you're using a cash flow modeling tool, that's great. But what are the assumptions underneath that? And are they real? Where did you get those from? There's lots of different strategies for taking income. So natural income uh, using the POTS method. So having different POTS for different stages of retirement. So a short term, longer term, medium term POT. Um, using the Bengen 4% rule, having guide rails, use something stochastic modeling tool. They're all valid strategies, but you need to understand why you're using them, what's the evidence behind them, and what are the risks within them. Um, they're also looking at guarantees. Do people need guarantees now or later? Um, obviously, annuity rates have, have crashed, uh, but are you monitoring annuity rates to know when they're actually going to get uh, to improve again? So these are all the things that the FCA are looking at. On top of that, we've had PROD. Um, product intervention and governance source book. In simple terms, both providers, asset managers, insurance companies and platforms, and what are called distributors advisors, need to be able to make sure their products meet the needs of an identifiable target market. Um, so we obviously need to be able to identify our target markets. Um, we've gone through the process of, as a DFM, uh, looking at the FCA's 10 target market customers and identify where our products are suitable. Um, uh, it, some firms think that this is a bit of a pain to actually go through the process. It's pretty simple and straightforward to do. Um, if you've got a good CRM or back office system, being able to identify um, the age and the wealth of your clients is pretty straightforward. Um, and that's a pretty good start. Um, and in fact, for those firms we've done this exercise with, they actually start to identify different client segments and therefore potentially possible different service propositions that might be suitable for those clients. So actually, it's, be, it's turned out to be more valuable than just this kind of compliance exercise. Typically, in a firm, what you'll discover is that your clients look like this. Um, uh, they start relatively young with a small amount of wealth, build their wealth over the years, and then into some kind of flexible um, retirement planning and then later life. Um, so that's why typically most firms have a, a life stage prod. So where are my clients in their life stage journey? Um, there's no right answer. Um, uh, you can segment your clients, your target markets, however you want to. Um, I think there's a concern that just doing it by by wealth is probably not the right answer. Um, a, a client who's 25 with £10,000 in their ISA uh, and a client who's 85 with £10,000 in their ISA probably have very different needs. Um, so just wealth is probably the wrong answer. Um, age, typically, in terms of life stage, is a pretty good way of doing it. Um, Rory Percival's provided some quite helpful stuff on that. Um, um, here's a little uh, example of uh, one of Rory's templates. Uh, so you can see down the left-hand side category, young accumulators, serious about retirement, glide path into retirement. And then a brief summary about what those clients are and what their needs are likely to be. Possible investment solutions, possible platform selection. Uh, and we see that more and more with the firms that we're working with, that they have uh, certainly a, a low cost accumulation platform and then a more sophisticated platform that's capable of delivering uh, the drawdown needs. And we'll look at that a bit later on. What's interesting is he also on the far right also talks about the advisory service. Uh, and this is what we've seen more and more as firms. Um, we remember you know, as we came out of RDR, it was kind of gold, silver, bronze service level, which was driven about wealth. This is now driven by the client segment. So you know, young accumulators, light touch, simple, straightforward planning. Um, as you go through your life journeys, you know, more complicated planning is required. Um, you, you might do cash flow modeling for young accumulators, but it's a pretty simple, you know, we're trying to aim for this. Once you're actually in retirement, cash flow modeling becomes critically important and also the tax planning around that. So you can see how a service proposition actually might evolve from doing your prod segmentation. Uh, you obviously also need to think from a profitability perspective in your business. Um, uh, clients in accumulation, then a, a percentage fee uh, is, works well. Um, in decumulation, then perhaps a pounds fee works well. Uh, so again, there's opportunities to kind of tailor your profitability around your service proposition. Uh, so prod actually is, is, can be quite powerful. Um, why do we need to bother with prod? Um, 
what what the regulator has done quite cleverly is moved away from um, suitability at an individual level, although that's still obviously important, uh, where the, the FCA might come in and say, we don't think this is suitable, you say it is, they say it isn't, and you go backwards and forwards. If you can't identify how a particular product is suitable for a target market, that's a rule break. Uh, that's a much quicker compliance process than going through the suitability argument. Um, so they're pushing suitability up a level. Um, so if the FCA turn up at your office uh, and say, can you show you know, how your solution is designed for your target markets? Um, uh, don't know is probably the wrong answer. Um, because I said it is, is probably the wrong answer. Um, what you need is the analysis and thinking that you did to actually show why they're suitable. Um, that's what prod is all about. Prod's not just a separate exercise. It's actually how do I use that in my business? Um, again, we've seen that with um, uh, in in. Uh, platform due diligence, for example, um, one firm has uh, nearly all of their clients. Um, they've been going a number of years as a, as a family firm. So they're now on the third generation and therefore they have a number of third generation clients. So if you have grandparents, parents and children, yeah, then the need for family linking for having junior ISIS um, becomes critically important for your clients. And um, that therefore becomes a critical component of your platform due diligence. So you would need to have that flexibility from your product providers. So again, you can see how prod isn't just a standalone exercise, it needs to flow right the way through your suitability. Um, uh, here's some simple templates, I'm happy to share those with you. Um, you can see the one on the left-hand side, um, um, smaller investors, serious about retirement, later life, um, and then what sort of uh, investment stage they might be. Um, it's hard to see the XL on the other side, that's a very similar thing. Um, so any support and help you need with prod, then happy to provide that. So what is a CRP? Um, what is a CIP? Uh, what's the difference between them? Um, CIPs first came out um, in assessing suitability part one, uh, actually a phrase coined by Rory Percival, centralized investment proposition. Um, uh, they, it was basically a response from the FCA saying, we are noticed that a number of firms are streamlining the way they make their investment decisions. Um, uh, that's effectively where they came from. Uh, what's the difference between a CIP and a CRP? Um, this tries to provide some of the, the differences. Um, what's important in accumulation? What's important in deem accumulation? Um, attitude to risk is quite important in the accumulation stage. Can you afford to take the risk? Uh, in decumulation, capacity for loss, um, or what the FCA now refers to as ability to bear loss, probably becomes more important. Is longevity important in accumulation? Yes, far more important in decumulation. Income's not important in accumulation, clearly important in decumulation. So you can see each of these things might actually start to drive what are the different areas that we need to think about in accumulation and decumulation. And, and that in essence is what your CRP is about. CIPs have become very simple, very simple documents. You know, we believe in long-term asset allocation. We believe in saving versus investing. We believe in diversification, simple, straightforward. Decumulation, there are a far greater number of areas that you need to have considered for each client. Um, and, and these point to some of those different areas. That being said, uh, there is no need, there is no regulatory requirement to have uh, either a CIP or indeed a CRP. What you must be able to demonstrate is that you've assessed the detailed hard and soft facts for customers. So your fact finding process needs to be good. Um, you need to identify why your particular solutions are suitable for both accumulation and your decumulation clients. And you need to be able to show how you manage your conflict, conflicts of interest. Um, you can do that on an individual client by client basis. Um, obviously, most people suggest it makes sense to make that a process in terms of do a lot of the thinking and then apply that thinking across clients. That's effectively what the process becomes. Here's the thinking, here's the evidence behind, here's what we deliver. Can you use your current CIP for your CRP? Um, can we not just take the growth as income? Um, yes, you can, but have you thought about the different tax wrappers? Uh, CRP is not just about pensions, it's about all the tax wrappers. How are you going to manage the need for guaranteed income? Have you modeled and stress tested being able to take that growth as income. Um, so what are your assumptions for that? Are you taking, what about using natural income? Have you thought about sequence risk? 
So you can see how, yes, the solutions might be the same, but the thinking behind it needs to be different. Key areas to think about. Now, if you have done cash flow modeling, uh, one area the regulator is concerned about is what are the assumptions that you use in your cash flow modeling? Um, it is easy to justify a switch from anything into your solution um, if you assume uh, a 1% inflation rate and a 9% growth rate. Now, I'm not suggesting anybody would do that, but you can see how sensitive your cash flow modeling tool is the assumptions under, underneath it. So are those valid assumptions? Have you checked them? Have you tested them? Do you understand what they are? That's a potential conflict because if you're moving clients from their uh, occupational scheme to a personal pension, uh, you can twist the assumptions with your cash flow modeling tool. So be very careful with that. Um, why not use an annuity? If you haven't even considered an annuity, there's a potential conflict. The conflict is obviously you take an ongoing fee from not being an annuity and a one-off fee from an annuity. Um, so these are some of the areas that the FTO are particularly keen on. So you need to understand those conflicts and document them so that you can manage those. So how might you go about building a CRP? What do they look like? Um, uh, in the next stage, we're going to give you some ideas and, and the process that you might go through uh, and some things to think about. Um, at the core of this um, is the fact find. Uh, that's a critically important part, which we'll touch on. So CIPs, simple, straightforward, designed to give you repeatable, consistent outcomes. CRPs recognize there are very different uh, dynamics between pre and post retirement in terms of providing income. You need to identify what those risks are and how you manage those. As I said, you don't have to have um, a written down CRP, but you do need to have a strategy for managing those risks. And it makes sense to have a consistent structured approach across your firm, uh, particularly in a multi-advisor firm, uh, having different advisors doing different things uh, is unlikely to be smiled on by the regulator. What sort of things would we want to think about? You would want to think about data on longevity. You need to have a proper assessment of capacity for loss. Um, categorization of expenditure. Um, very early fact finds had very simple, you know, tell us roughly what you need. Um, I don't believe that's any longer, uh, that's appropriate any longer. Um, you need to have a much more detailed analysis of the expenditure and how the expenditure is likely to change over time. Um, and particularly as important is when you're taking or suggesting withdrawal rates, where is your evidence for the rates that you are suggesting? How have you evolved? How have you got to those numbers? What testing have you done? What papers have you read? What evidence do you have for that? So the key important part of that is providing the evidence in your CRP. And of course, you need to have a fact find that actually draws out the information that you need. Um, different clients will have different attitudes to the amount of guaranteed income, the amount of flexibility of income, uh, whether they are going to receive inheritance or they want to leave inheritance. Uh, the difference in terms of how much they want to leave for any potential spouse, um, what they're going to happen for mental capacity, what's the health history of the family. So all of these things need to be captured and discussed with the client. Um, uh, here are some examples of the sorts of things that you might think in your time to fact find. Um, I don't need to go through them all. Um, obviously, a copy of the slides will be available later on. Important things. What are the assumptions underlying this? Um, uh, and how are you going to manage sequence of return risk? Um, here's some other areas that you might want to think about in terms of mental health. Um, uh, as a nation, we are now living longer in poor health than ever before. Um, it's something that we don't expect to happen to us, um, uh, but from personal experience, believe me, um, it can come on to your family quite quickly. Um, and, and if you haven't done the right planning, uh, while there might be assets in the right place, actually be able to draw those assets and to have power of attorney in terms of drawing the right assets at the right time is quite important. That all becomes part of the retirement planning. What steps might you go through? Um, here's a kind of simple diagram about the steps, the kind of the process. Starting with prod, what do my target customers look like? Um, what do my target customers look like now? And what do my target customers look like in a few months time or a few years time? Am I changing the shape of my business? From that, what service offer do I want to offer? Um, uh, if I've identified, as we did with one firm, uh, a significant number of their um, assets under management as a firm were with clients who were over 85. And um, clearly in terms of service offer to those clients, it was critically important to look at how we're we going to make sure that we maintain those assets and um, what service you're going to offer to try and help to do that intergenerational planning. Fact find process. Um, 
Uh, I've got an example of a kind of retirement uh, planning uh, fact find if that will be useful. Again, just some ideas and thoughts to integrate. Cash flow modeling tools, I think critically important in terms of decumulation. Um, we're trying to manage the long-term series of income payments into the future with a pot of money today. A cash flow modeling tool is an obvious way to do that. Then obviously you have your investment philosophy beliefs. Uh, do you believe in asset allocation? Do you believe in active or passive? Um, they're all appropriate, but then how do you deploy those and use those in your CIP or CRP? Um, together with obviously the information and the evidence you've got about withdrawal rates. That allows you to do due diligence. Um, of course, if you've got the right service offer and you know the solutions you want to provide, then that makes your due diligence, easier, much, your due diligence process much easier. Uh, and the last piece, which most people forget, don't forget to show the clients how valuable uh, providing those good outcomes are. So step by step, what might we think about CRP? Um, uh, uh, what do you believe in terms of investment principles and why? So what's your investment philosophy? <clears throat> Um, what, what are the behavioural and the human risks that we need to think about? Sequence of return risk being an obvious one. Um, how are we going to use tax wrappers for income through retirement? Um, how are we going to robustly test you know, the capacity for loss for clients or the ability for them to bear the loss of income? Um, uh, if you don't test it rigorously, then it will be tested rigorously in court, I'm afraid. Um, What's your evidence and your data around suitability withdrawals? Where's the information that you've drawn from that? What are your cash flow modeling tools? What are your assumptions that you've put into that? Um, stress testing is quite important. Um, the regulator believes that you should be able to demonstrate that you are providing the best possible outcome and that you challenge customers when they make uh, or, or have uh, poor views. So if a client says, I want to take 8% per annum from their portfolio, you, you need to show them what the impact of that 8% per annum is going to do with a 5% growth rate. You need to clearly explain the risks of their strategy. Um, one of the advisors we did some work with um, actually talked about, it's interesting to understand the psychology of your client. Um, are they a spender or a saver? Um, uh, my dad, who sadly passed away from the COVID virus, um, was a saver. Um, you know, he was 86, um, and and even then he was asking me where should he put his ISA money this year. Uh, to which my question was, Dad, what are you saving for? Um, you've already got four pension plans. You know you're doing nicely. So so challenge clients. Um, um, if you if you turn up to a client and say yes, I'm a really good saver, and every time you go to see them, there's a new Range Rover outside. Yeah, then maybe they're not a saver. That's really important in terms of how they're actually going to manage their money and how you're going to help them manage their money over time. Uh, what is your withdrawal policy and how do you communicate that to the client? Um, what is the review process and the frequency of it? And obviously, how do you manage conflicts of interest? Uh, so those two slides are probably quite useful in terms of have I got all of those things covered? How can we help? Um, on the next couple of slides, I'll give you a couple of checklists and handouts that might be useful. Uh, and we'll also look at a little bit around the value advice um, and a little bit more around conflicts. So simple checklists, uh, prod. Um, have I written down prod? And actually, is it embedded in what I do? So not only have I looked at what my customer segments look like, but actually, can I see that driving right the way through in terms of my platform selection, yeah, my product selection, and my advice provide, provision? Cash flow modeling tool we've touched, about, touched on, fact find annuity rates. Um, annuity rates can change very, very quickly. Um, there's a lot of speculation at the moment that we're about to head for uh, an increased inflation. Uh, we may see a very, very rapid rise um, in, in gilt yields. Um, and actually, in the forward market, they can move very, very quickly. So annuity rates, rates, annuity rates may change very quickly. Um, safe withdrawal rate, cash buffer. If you're going to hold a cash buffer, um, where's the right place to hold the cash buffer? Should I hold it on the platform? Well, um, if the platform doesn't charge me for cash or pays me some interest, but the total value helps drove my overall cost down, then maybe I should. Um, if it doesn't, then maybe I hold it off platform. Uh, risk profiling we've covered, investment assumptions. Um, you know, are you using pots or not using pots? Um, what is your advisor service offering? So all of these things will be covered in your CRP. Um, how are you going to charge? Uh, the FCA has already mentioned, you know, as assets in decumulation from a client shrink, um, do they, does the client become unsustainable? So are you wanting to get rid of a client just at the time of maximum stress when they're getting low on income and actually need that? 
So how are you going to deal with that? Um, uh, checklist for platforms, a uh, little example coming up, uh, some of the things you might want to think about what your platform is capable of in Drawdown, um, how you're going to deal with vulnerable clients. We're going to have more and more and more of those um, as we go through time. Uh, and the last thing, how do you show your value? So on this slide, I apologize, it's probably a little bit fuzzy. Uh, on the left-hand side, I was just doing a simple little CRP checklist. Um, so these uh, are the different areas that you might want to look at. So first one, prod. Yes, have I done prod? Tick, yes, it's documented, but documented isn't enough. Tick, have I actually embedded that in my processes? Can I show in my due diligence that I've used my custom segments to drive the right solutions? Um, so there's a simple little checklist there about the things that you might want to use for a CRP. So you can see from this that a CRP is rather than a written down process that you might have with a CIP, which is pretty simple, it's actually more a series of ideas and thoughts that you actually bring into your advice process. So it's slightly more nebulous than a simple CRP that says, we're going to use low cost multi-asset passive funds for our solutions in accumulation. Yeah. On the right hand side, there's just a little uh, template that I've got, uh, which is more of an index uh, for a centralized investment proposition. And again, happy to send you that. So these are just some of the areas that I think would sit within a centralized investment proposition. Uh, and again, some links there to different um, documents that might help um, from the FCA, um, asset allocation evidence, um, uh, how you might do due diligence, et cetera. Um, because they're available if you would like those. Um, this is a very simple example. I talked about embedding prod in your due diligence process. Um, if you decide that you want to go down the POTS route of holding multiple POTS to a short, medium and long term POT for retirement, actually, can your platform cope with that? Um, and can it cope with it in both accumulation and decumulation? Uh, that's quite important. Um, uh, uh, number seven is quite important, which we discovered on a platform that we use. Um, if within a model portfolio, um, you have one fund that becomes suspended, uh, what we discovered is that all of the income from all of the fund is suspended to the client. Um, that's a nice, not a nice thing for the client to find out uh, two weeks after they were expecting to have their income paid. So there's a bunch of things that you might need to think about in terms of what your solution is going to be. Can my platform actually deliver that solution? Um, uh, advanced by Embark will no doubt have some thoughts on that. Um, this is, um, I don't know, a sales aid or a poster that I've developed and happy to send you a copy of. Um, the client has a very, very simple question. Do I have enough to retire? Um, the difficulty is that that very simple question has a very complex answer because underneath that, there are at least 20 different areas that you need to think about in terms of have you got enough money? What return assumption are you using? What's the cash buffer? What's your capacity for loss? So this just tries to highlight to the client, yes, there's an awful lot of work that goes on under the bonnet yeah, when we go, yes, you've got enough to retire. Um, this is what advisors do. You provide confidence in the financial futures of clients. There's an awful lot of work going on underneath the bonnet, I think is appropriate, you should show clients. So again, if you'd like a copy of that to either use with clients, put up on the wall, then they're happy to do that. Uh, the other thing we provide is a little thing called the value advice tree. Um, there's the tree on the left hand side. I've just broken down to kind of three areas, money, goals and confidence. Uh, and there's, I think, 24 different areas where I think financial advisors have the potential to add value to clients. Um, I produced that as a little word document and it's got a little description of each of the 24. Um, if, if you want to use that, cut, paste it and um, do whatever you want it, blog it, tweet it, then again, happy to do that. Um, What's interesting is it's not just about looking after your money. It's about achieving your goals. And a lot of it is about delivering confidence in the future. Um, and there's a couple of studies done in terms uh, Morningstar did one recently. What do clients value the most? Yeah, it's giving me confidence in my future. It's the simplicity of the message from advisors. That's what they're really looking for. Um, so this might help to demonstrate some of that value. Uh, I just wanted to touch briefly on the conflicts we've mentioned. Um, the big issue that we have with pensions freedoms is that customers want their cake and eat it. Um, uh, because we have massive behavioral barriers in terms of how we think about things, um, hyperbolic discounting being one of them, um, most clients would much rather have £200,000 now than £12,000 a year for life. Um, sadly, if you take £12,000 a year out of your £200,000, you're much better off with the £12,000 for life. Um, that's the sort of stuff that we need to challenge our customers with. Uh, customers have an enormous number of barriers to actually getting this planning right. We can't think long term because our brains are wired to make shortcuts. 
Um, our brains use huge amounts of energy, um, so our brains are always trying to find shortcuts. And a lot of the time, shortcuts are great. Uh, when it comes to retirement planning, unfortunately, shortcuts are bad. Um, you need to think about the long term. You need to have some long term assumptions. Um, you can easily show that with the cash flow, with the cash flow modeling for a client. Um, show them what happens if they take more income out in the first three years. Um, uh, you need to demonstrate all of the options, including annuities. You need to challenge your customer when they say things which are bonkers. Um, we're not order takers, we're advisors. So we need to challenge the customers when they when they uh, they do daft things or suggest daft things and help to show them that. Um, important point, um, if there are disadvantages in your strategy, you need to show them clearly. Um, uh, clearly taking a non-guaranteed income versus a guaranteed income, you know, there is an advantage and a disadvantage in each of those. They need to be clearly explained to the client. What the FCA is expecting from its retirement income review is that you provide that there is not a demonstrably better way of achieving the client's goals. So that's the kind of standard that we need to judge ourselves against. Um, just to touch on annuity rates, um, uh, that's why they're not so clever. Um, that's the 15 year gilt yield in the UK. Um, you can see it's almost managed to get to zero. Um, uh, so there's only one way for annuity rates to go from now, uh, possibly. So next steps. So I hope that's been useful uh, as a session. Um, if you would like any of the templates, um, drop us a line at, at TCF uh, or your Embark contact, uh, and we'll give you a feedback form, and you can request any of that information. Um, I think the Embark team are going to follow up anyway, um, uh, just in terms of helping to see whether your platform is CRP capable. Um, next stage, we're happy to do kind of do one-to-one you know, -one firm sessions, or maybe another workshop. Kind of depends on demand. I think the Embark guys are going to follow that up. Uh, one is a standard session on CIP refresh. Um, so how might we go through refreshing our CIP and then a little bit more of a workshop session on CRP? Um, let me just show you those. So the CIP refresh, we'd look at, you know, what are the gaps you've currently got? We'd share prod templates. Um, we've got some templates for investment process and philosophies. Um, we've got scoring templates for due diligence um, and evidence and sources. And we can even pull together for you a kind of a sample CIP folder. Um, there's a small cost involved in that just for the printing of and developing of it. But that might be useful as a workshop in terms of refreshing your CIP. Uh, and for CRP, um, uh, uh, this is still a draft paper, and it'll probably be a draft paper forever. Um, uh, these are all the things that I need to, that you, uh, my view is you need to think around CRP development. So it's got kind of key processes, key points. It's got the kind of 20 planning areas that you need to think about. Um, it provides a wealth of evidence in terms of data sources and that. So we would share that. And again, prod templates and checklists um, to help build your CRP. Um, we're not trying to shoehorn you into this is the right way to do our CRP. These are lots of ideas and templates that you can adapt um, for what you need. So summary, hopefully uh, you've now got a broad understanding of what CRP is all about, uh, understanding the differences between a CIP and a CRP. Uh, we've looked at what you should consider and what's good practice when we build a CRP. Uh, and hopefully you've got some checklists and ideas um, to be able to refine, challenge your either your CIP or your CRP. Um, Next steps, as I said, uh, checklists and templates are available. Uh, the, the two workshop sessions are also available, um, however you want to do those. Um, we'll provide the CPD certificates. Um, the guys, I think, are going to send out the feedback form. Uh, and most importantly of all, do not forget that you are really, really, really valuable to your customers. Um, thank you. I hope that's useful. Um, I will now try to stop sharing and go back into the chat mode. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Dan, for that uh, excellent presentation, which has obviously been packed full of practical, actionable resource uh, for advisors. And uh, I know the slides, as you said, are available um, and we'll be happy to share the slides and all the resource as well um, with your um, business account manager. Um, I've been monitoring the um, the chat functions and I can't see that there have been uh, sort of any questions that have come in. I'm sure there are lots of questions out there, but um, in the absence uh, of those, obviously we can take those up uh, individually at, at a later point. Um, I'd probably just like to ask uh, our regional sales manager, Simon Hayter, just for a few closing remarks. Uh, hopefully, Simon, this handover will go smoothly. Simon, are you there? I certainly am, Dan. Thank you. <laughs> um, more, morning, everybody, and, um, and thanks, guys, I, uh, especially with the little, little gremlins at the start. It's, it's always... Uh, a worry when that happens. I thought you did magnificently, so well done. Um, 
So to everybody else, thank you for your time today. And, and I very, very much hope you found it worthwhile. Um, no one's left, so that's a very good sign. Um, I, I guess a little bit of personal disclosure. I'm, I'm really, really passionate about, about this, and I guess a lot of you are as well. And it's been really, really interesting to me how um, at retirement and in retirement uh, planning has evolved over the last decade or so. Uh, and, and maybe we've been quite fortunate that we've evolved with it. But I'm 53 and I know that I don't want an accumulation strategy when uh, being applied when I start to take income. And I'm sure you all feel the same. Everything that Dan's been through there, uh, and there's a lot of it, everything in isolation I think is really obvious and we all know that. But it can become a little bit um, confusing when you look at the whole piece and try to pull that together. Um, as Dan said, the solutions um, for accumulation and decumulation often will be the same. But I really like the way that he puts, but the thinking needs to be different. So, for example, for me, the cash flow modelling becomes so important in retirement. Tax efficient planning every year becomes so important using personal allowance and ISA allowance, perhaps using CGT, health uh, considerations and whether annuity should be coming into play, as well as intergenerational planning and all of those things, which for me, as a, if I were an advisor, is the piece I would find really interesting and really adding value in a big way to, um, to the clients. So I often find with sessions like today, there is so much detail, which all makes sense as you go through it. But when you come to action, it's sometimes difficult to know where to start. I'll, we wouldn't um, presume to uh, to suggest what's the right right way forward. So so the guys will will speak to you individually to see what your thoughts were, and if you do want to take it forward in any way, what would best suit you to personalise and tailor for your businesses. But we can certainly offer one to one support. We can do workshops um, for firms or, or or for wider piece. We don't know the answers to that, so I'll be very interested in your feedback. Uh, I hope it's been of worth uh, of uh, worth your time this morning. I thank you very much for attending. Thanks, Simon. And then I think just finally from me, uh, we will be sending a feedback um, form through to you. So it would be you know, great for us if you could complete that and send that back. And then that helps us for future events as well. But uh, other than that, thanks for your time this morning and um, we'll speak to you all soon.